Hi everyone. So if you're one of my regular viewers, this video is actually geared towards my students here at Parkland College. And I'm showing the anatomy of each of the lathes that we have here in class so they know how to change speeds and feeds and use the controls. Um, if you're not interested in seeing that, you can go ahead and stop the video right now. If you happen to own a similar Sheldon lathe or are thinking of buying one, please feel free to keep watching. You'll learn how the controls work. On this machine, the speeds are all changed by changing the positions of belts. And you have 16 speeds here. Uh, there's a high and low belt position, and then there's four pulley positions going from the motor to the jack shaft. Uh, so if you wanted to have 1600 RPM, you would need to be in the high belt position, and you would have to be in the belt position all the way to the right on the shivs. If you wanted to be at 50 RPM, you would need to be in the low belt position and all the way to the left on the shivs. Now this one, in order to get the lowest speeds, it also has what's called a back gear, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. So this is the belt arrangement on the Sheldon lathe. These two pulleys over here, going from the motor to this jack shaft, these are your high and low speeds. So in this case, we're currently in high. We have a large shiv going to a sort of medium sized shiv. If we wanted to be in low position, this pulley is flat, so you can actually just pull the, uh, the belt off to the side and then reposition it, small pulley to large pulley, and you'll be in low speed. Now this is hard to do with the camera in, in the way, but let me see if I can get it here. There we go. It helps to roll it on just like that, and everything should be good. Now we're in the low belt position, which would be the low settings on the speed chart that I showed you earlier. This handle here gives you a little bit of slack when you pull it forward, and that allows you to change between these four belt positions. So you have the uh, jack shaft here in between the motor and the lathe itself, and then this shaft up here is powered with a flat belt that goes up to the spindle. Like I said when I was showing you the speed chart, the leftmost position on these shivs here coincides with the leftmost position on the speed chart. And then this would be the second position, third, and the rightmost position right here. And again, if you wanted to change from one to the other, you go to the smaller pulley. So in this case, I move to that pulley first before I, I make my way over to the next one. If we were going left, you would go to the smaller pulley here and then move up to the next one over on top. And then just don't forget to lift the handle back up so that you remove the slack from the system. You'll find all of the belts for changing speeds behind this door right here. On the speed chart, it lists all of the lowest speeds on the lathe as being in back gear. This is the only lathe in the shop that has a back gear, um, but it's not that difficult to master. Um, everything on the back gear assembly is in this section right here, and you have a handle back here that will engage the back gear, which is this right here. And then you also have a pin here that will lock this bull gear to the rest of the spindle. Currently, it's actually set up in back gear. So I'll turn this on so you can see it. And what you'll see is this section being driven by the motor, which drives this gear, which of course drives this because they're on the same shaft, and then drives this gear, which is currently rotating free from the spindle. If you wanted to go out of back gear, you would have to move this handle back. This disengages this gearing section right back here. And there's a section on the spindle that's got a mark on it. In this case, it looks like a large O. So you line up the marks, and then there's a pin on the side that you would push in.
Right now, since the back gear is out, I can freely move this section of the spindle, which is directly attached to the chuck. You can see there's a mark right there and a mark right there that looks like a large O. So if you line those two up, then this pin right here on the side should push in and now everything moves together and we're back in direct drive. So the motor is actually driving this belt right back here and that is actually directly driving the spindle. Changing feed rates and threads per inch on this machine are incredibly easy. You've got a feed rate chart here that's listed A through F and 1 through 10. And then you have these two tumblers. So in this case, it's at B10, which feed rate wise is 14 thousandths per revolution, and it's also 15 threads per inch. If we wanted to be feeding at about 3 thousandths per revolution, uh, you've got 2 and 9 tenths right there, and that would be at E2. So you pull out the plunger here on the tumbler, slide it over, engage it in E, and then do the same thing here. You pull out the end, slide it over, and engage it in 2. Sometimes you'll need to move the chuck in order to get those gears to move so you can make them mesh just like any other lathe. If we wanted to be cutting 20 threads per inch, for instance, we would need to find 20 on the chart, which is right here, and that is at C3. So again, you pull out the plunger, put it into the C position, move that one to 3, and now when we're in threading mode, we'll be cutting 20 threads per inch. To reverse the feed direction on the machine, you use this handle right here and you push in this brass paddle and move it up into position. You'll probably have to move the chuck in order to get it to mesh, and then you would just drop it back down. In the down position like this, you will be feeding towards the headstock when the lathe is going forward. So just like any other lathe, you have your longitudinal feed handle, which moves the carriage back and forth. You have your cross feed here, and you have your compound there. The dials on these are moved by loosening this set screw, and then you can turn it freely and zero it into any position. There is no dial on the longitudinal feed handle. So if you want to make accurate movements that way, you could use a dial indicator set up on a mag base, or you can turn the compound parallel to the lathe axis and make your movements with the compound. This handle engages power feed for both longitudinal and cross feed, and depending on where this plunger is, it will determine whether you're in longitudinal or cross feed. With the plunger in this position all the way down, you should be in longitudinal feed. And you pull that out, it will engage the clutch. If you move the plunger all the way up, you should be in cross feed. And you can see your crossfeed handle is moving now. In order to thread, you have to be in the middle position. Otherwise, there's an interlock that will keep you from being able to engage the half nuts, which are right here. The power switch for this machine is right here on the headstock, that's the only one, and it's a drum switch. So you turn it one way for forward, and the other way for reverse. The threading dial for this machine is on the right side of the carriage, directly right of the half nuts, which makes it quite convenient to use. This style of threading dial is very common on machines, and it will show a 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then you have these half marks. The half marks are there to allow you to easily cut double start threads. So one of your threads would be cut at 1, 2, 3, or 4, and the other would be cut at the half marks on this machine. The tailstock on this machine is also pretty typical of an older machine. You have an actual nut that locks it instead of a uh, cam lock. Uh, 
It's a little unwieldy, but it's not too bad once you get used to it. And the wrench is actually captured so you can't lose it. That allows you to slide back and forth. This is your quill lock just like on any other tailstock. It allows you to lock the tailstock into position uh, when you're using a live center to support something. If you were drilling or using any other Morse taper tool, you would want to have that unlocked so you could freely move the quill. This tailstock also has a dial on it, which just like the other dials, you've got a screw that would lock it into position. And there's a witness mark on the spindle right there that would allow you to zero it. Um, each mark on the dial is one thousandth of an inch and it's 125 thousandths per revolution or one eighth of an inch per revolution. Just like most of the other machines in the shop, this lathe has a Morse 3 taper. The same taper as all of the other lathes except for the LeBlond, which I'll show in another video. All of the machines in the shop have some sort of electrical disconnect on the back side of the machine. Most of them look like this, a yellow and red lockout tagout switch. Now if you can see red through this hole, that means that it's on. If you can see a space, that means it's off because you can put a padlock through there to lock out power to the machine in case you need to work on it, either to change gears or replace belts, something like that. You don't want someone being able to walk up to the machine and accidentally turn it on while your hands are inside. Quite often someone will come up to me in class and tell me that their machine is not working and they can't get it to turn on. And quite often it's that someone for one reason or another has turned off this electrical disconnect. So if you don't have any power, check that first.